Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about the acupuncture channels, these things we work with every day in our practice. So, of course, in traditional Chinese medicine, these are the main pathways where qi and blood flow in the body. The acupuncture points, of course, being the main nodes or areas where we can affect the flow of qi and blood in the channels. And really, the central premise of treatment is that by needling, twainaring, using our various treatment modalities, by regulating this flow of qi and blood, we can treat disease, um, return the body to health and homeostasis. So the channel would definitely predate the point system historically. It's quite interesting. The first references we have are in the tombs of Ma Hongwei. And uh, these texts and images talk about the channels more in a health cultivation practice, Dao Yin exercises, breathing exercises. And it's not until we get to the Neijing, Yellow Emperor's Classic, where the channel and point system is systematized within the context of Chinese medicine practice, within the context of acupuncture, within the context of massage and herbs and these kind of things. And then the classics further systematize the channel and point system throughout Chinese history. But the channel system as we know it today still remains relatively unchanged since the time of the Neijing and the Han Dynasty. So, are they real? Do they exist? Are they physical structures, tangible things we can feel? Or are they, as some researchers suggested, an abstract concept because we can't find an absolutely exact equivalent in Western medicine and Western anatomy? Um, and the original mistranslation of uh, the Jing Lu as Meridian may have led to some misconceptions, especially in the West, as to the exact nature of the channels we're working with as, uh, as practitioners. So, today we're going to look at the first three, blood vessels, nerve pathways, and fascia and connective tissue planes. And we're going to look at the anatomical correlations between these systems and tissues and the channels of Chinese medicine. I'm hopefully going to discuss the other two hypotheses in a separate lecture, so please do keep your eyes open for that on my YouTube channel and website. Let's start with the thrusting vessel and the Chong Mai with the aorta and the vena cava. Now clearly there is a direct anatomical correlation between both of these channels in the way they flow in the body. The aorta and the vena cava are of course the largest artery and vein in the body respectively and the Chong Mai in Chinese medicine is described as the sea of blood. So not only do the pathways mirror each other almost exactly, the Chong Mai gives a vascular description. And of course, the ancient Chinese would have been able to feel the, th the pulsing of the aorta through the abdomen upon pressure. So there's no doubt in my mind when they talked about the Chong Mai, they were directly referring to the aorta and the vena cava. Moving on to the heart and the lung channel, which also very closely follow the pathways of the ulnar and the radial arteries below the elbow. And as we can see in this image, the yin channels of the arm generally follow the arterial blood flow out of the chest from the axillary artery down into the brachial artery and then finally dividing into the ulnar and the radial arteries as they go past the elbow. The ulnar artery is arguably a slightly closer match to the heart channel with the radial artery flowing somewhere in between the lung and the large intestine channel. And here again we see the liver channel, which follows the pathway of the great saphenous vein and the great saphenous nerve. Now it's very interesting that the yin channels of the arms flow out of the chest towards the hands, just as the arterial blood flow flows out of the chest towards the extremities. And the yin channels of the legs, it's the opposite. They, they represent the venous return from the extremities of the feet upwards towards the abdomen. So this certainly uh, gives us a vascular explanation for the channels. So I don't think it's any coincidence um, that this is the case, that the, uh, the Chinese believed that the, uh, the qi flowed in these particular directions. And of course, if you look at the, uh, the history of bloodletting in Chinese medical history, clearly this uh, acupuncture had its developmental roots in bloodletting practices as well. So all of this supports the notion that there was a very definite connection to the vascular system when they were talking about the channels. 
Unfortunately, it gets a bit more complicated because there are other systems and pathways involved. So many researchers have suggested that the channel system was a, a kind of primitive attempt to describe the nervous system as we know it today. And of course, this wouldn't have been quite as easy to tangibly see and feel as the blood vessels. Um, and of course, the homeostatic regulatory functions of the nervous system in Western medicine, you could argue, more closely reflect the more holistic um, view of the channels in Chinese medicine as acting as this whole body regulatory system, the system that's able to regulate the processes between the different organs, the various tissues and glands. And of course, we can definitely see descriptive similarities in the kind of nervous sensations we get when we can feel a nerve with the descriptions of chi flow in the body. And I'm sure as practitioners, we will have the experience of needling a point and the patient getting the electric kind of shock down the, down the arm or up the leg, wherever, wherever. We may be uh, needling them. Um, so I think that's a very interesting correlation. And certainly, as was alluded to earlier, the, the neurological mechanisms of how acupuncture works have been quite well studied. We clearly know this is part of the puzzle. Of, um, of what's given acupuncture's clinical effect is its medium of action via the nervous system. And again, I've just got some examples here to show you, um, because it's clear that although the channels mirror the artery flows, they also lay closely to the nerve pathways. So here we can see the ulnar nerve running down the inner aspect of the forearm here, very close proximity to the heart channel. The median nerve runs exactly according to the pericardium channel. And the radial nerve, somewhat frustratingly, flows somewhere in between the sort of lung and large intestine channels as well. So again, some of the correlations are very exact, some are a little bit looser, but generally there's a, there's a very strong correlation in, in channel pathways. And of course you can do this with all the channels, so I've just picked a few to show you here that are quite interesting. Um, this is one of my favourites. So we can see here right at the top where the common perineal nerve branches into the superficial perineal nerve and the deep perineal nerve respectively at gallbladder 34 and then follows the pathway of the stomach yang ming and gallbladder shao yang leg channels again we've got direct anatomical comparisons of these channel systems in western anatomy another very interesting correlation between the nervous system and the channels in chinese medicine are the back shoe points which of course are uh, located along the spine roughly located anatomically over their respective organ the heart shoe roughly located over the heart itself for example and here we can see in this diagram in western medicine that each organ is actually innervated by one or more sympathetic nerves which emerge from the vertebral spaces and then travel to send signals to the organs themselves a really interesting correlation so i think we can make a, a hypothesis for chinese medicine in what happens when we needle the back shoe is that we're somehow stimulating or releasing or affecting these sympathetic organ nerves which are then giving signals and passing information to the organs themselves. Now I would love to see this tested in, uh, in some research at some point, uh, needling the back shoe and then seeing what kind of effect we can get on the organs themselves. So clearly the vascular system and the nervous system provide part of the explanation for what the channels are, but neither system fully explains the channels in its own right. And I believe really the best way to look at the channels in this respect is that they represent a collective grouping of all of the most important channels in our body, all the most important veins, arteries, nerve pathways, lymphatic vessels, connected tissue planes, that they represent the sum total of all these channels, which actually travel in very similar anatomical lines and pathways throughout the body. And these pathways are the meta channels of least resistance, most efficient communication and transportation throughout our body. And that this really is the best way to understand the channels of Chinese medicine. And fascia may be the anatomical substrate which can unite all these channels into one system. Now fascia is a matrix of connective tissue that runs throughout our body, connecting us from head to toe. And originally, when we first discovered fascia, we thought it was really responsible for maintaining our structural integrity and our posture. But the more research that was done on it, we started to discover 
that it acts as a whole body regulatory system in its own right. It actually functions somewhat like the nervous system on this level as it regulates communication between the nervous system, the blood, the blood vessels, the circulatory system, the endocrine system and the immune system into one webbing of connective tissue. So in this sense we can think of the fascia as connecting the body not only anatomically but physiologically. And this is really relevant to acupuncture and Chinese medicine theory which is of course based on this uh, premise that there's this fundamental meta-system in the body, this fundamental regulatory system which we can affect all the other systems and tissues that kind of has a, a hierarchy on top that can affect and have a secondary effect down onto these systems. And I think there's good evidence to suggest that the more research is done, the more we'll find that this may be fascia. And of course, the parallels between acupuncture and other fascial therapies are very striking. You know, there are many modalities within the sort of acupuncture umbrella, tweena, moxa, kapi, gua sha. All of these therapies, we're directly working with the connective tissue. We're working with the fascia. That's what, first and foremost, what we're stimulating. Um, and of course, palpation was a very common part of diagnosis traditionally in Chinese medicine. Is sort of sadly declining a little bit as a diagnosis method. So I'm hoping this will encourage you all to get your hands on your patients tomorrow morning and start to feel these channels a bit more for yourselves as well. Um, and of course, I think the development of the channel system and the discovery of the channel system was certainly um, palpation and touch and exploration of people's bodies was probably a, a big part in the development of, um, of mapping out the channel system. So there's a lot of research that has drawn very real correlations between the acupuncture channels and very real fascial connected tissue lines through various methods. We've got computer constructed models, dissection, MRI scans, ultrasound scans, uh, various different methods have shown these sort of close associations. And uh, maybe some of the most interesting are Myers in his anatomy trains through dissection. Myers um, showed these pathways to be in un undeniably similar locations to the acupuncture channels and the sinew channels. And um, about 50% of his dissections have been confirmed openly, with others, confirmation of others still pending. So I don't suppose I need to tell you which channels these are. Anybody? The lateral line? Gallbladder, very good. And the superficial back line? The bladder, yes, I heard it, very good. These are real tangible structures that exist. This is not an abstract concept or you know, an esoteric metaphys metaphysical um, line that we're working with. This is real connective tissue we're feeling or we're needling. So this is really one of the key things we want to figure out. What, what is going on when we need an acupuncture point? And there's been some interesting research done, certainly that shows that when we need an acupuncture point on a channel, we get measurable effects distally um, down the same channel. And those effects are far more clear than if we need them off the channel on a non-acupuncture point. And perhaps more interestingly, we've got very real biochemical changes that happen when we stimulate the fascia and when we needle the fascia and the connective tissue. So we can make um, a conclusion or a theory on the working mechanism of acupuncture that incorporates the neurological hypothesis and the neurological explanation for acupuncture mechanisms as well. That when we needle the fascia, this produces very, various biochemical changes in the body fibroblast and mast cell proliferation, various other immune cell activity. It affects the blood vessels and the sensory nerves. By stimulating the fascia and the connective tissue, by stimulating or releasing this tissue, we are having a knock-on effect on all the other systems and tissues in the body. And this theory could very easily explain the wide-ranging clinical effects of acupuncture, the wide-ranging actions that I'm sure many of us see in our clinics every day. Uh, this fascia may be the key to kind of unite all these different tissues and systems into one theory that we're working with. So I think there's a lot of promise in this. Uh, this is a fascial connective tissue hypothesis, and uh, researchers like Langevin in particular have been um, are the main sort of researchers and proponents of it. And really it's by working with the fascia, needling and stimulating the fascia, and having a secondary effect on all these other systems 
which is helping bring the body back into homeostasis. So, thank you everyone. I hope you have enjoyed the talk. I hope this is encouraging you to think of the channels as a, a real entity, a real entity we can see, we can get our hands on, in order to, when, when these patients come in our doors, we can actually get our hands on them, feel what's going on a little bit more, get a more tangible grasp of their pathologies and their illnesses. And I think it's a, it's a great tool to look into these things and to, uh, to help us understand and get better results in our clinics. Thank you very much. Thank you.